Hello. And thank you so much for joining us today. We're having a small technical issue at the moment with our slides, um, but uh, I'm hoping that that is going to be resolved very quickly, um, if you'll just bear with me. But my understanding is that we have uh, an audience with us today from all over the world, um, from Japan and the Philippines and, and other places as well. And uh, so it's wonderful, I think, although we'd all love to be in Paris, to uh, be joining everyone uh, uh, from around the world uh, in all these different places. So I'm going to try and see if our technology will work with the slides and shift into the slide deck. The project that I am going to be showcasing today is about first collaboration, second about driving investment into nature, coastal biodiversity and nature-based solutions to build a more sustainable future. And third, it's about deploying financial and insurance tools and innovation to recover faster and build greater resilience to change. We launched the Ocean Risk and Resilience Action Alliance, or AURA, in September 2019 at the United Nations during the Secretary General's Climate Action Summit. So please come with me now on a journey to understand why we've set this up. Uh, this is a groundbreaking multilateral, uh, multi-stakeholder alliance and some of the work that we've begun to invest into and how we plan to build it further. The ocean is vital for supporting life on our planet. It's also a significant source of goods and services to the world economy. But our ocean is changing faster today than at any time in human history. Ocean warming, rising sea levels, acidification, marine pollution and habitat destruction are all creating greater risk and uncertainty with wide ranging implications for coastal communities, infrastructure, biodiversity and the lives and livelihoods of billions of people. This table um, is from a Crow Forum report on insurability and resilience in a changing climate, released in January 2019. It paints a really stark picture. It evaluates the potential impacts of climate change based on IPCC projected scenarios. And you can see that if we exceed the 1.5 degree Paris target, we have significant problems ahead of us. With half to almost two meters of sea level rise in some places, and these projections are increasing, significantly stronger and wetter tropical cyclones, a higher frequency of extreme rainfall, and between 11 and $27 trillion in coastal assets to defend. That is ocean risk. It is a shift in perspective to look at the climate emergency and biodiversity crisis from the ocean looking in. The global investment manager BlackRock told investors last year that new methods of understanding and forecasting climate risks show that many in the financial sector have underestimated their exposure to the extreme weather events that are likely to result from global temperature rise. Ocean heating is behind many of those extreme events. And we've seen that just this past week in an already record-setting 2020 Atlantic hurricane season. Hurricane Eta neared Category 5, so at 157 miles per hour of winds or higher. Some models indicate that it might have reached this category even before landfall, which would make it the first Atlantic storm to reach Category 5 in November since 1932. ETA has matched the 2005 record as the 28th named storm in the Atlantic hurricane season, which specialists indicate is far from over. The season has been especially exacerbated by higher than average sea surface temperatures in the Caribbean and Atlantic due to ocean heating, and ETA continues uh, to to potentially wreak havoc uh, this week again. Already, more than 40% of the world's populations live in coastal areas. Tens of millions are driven into poverty each year as natural disasters edge out already marginal centers with huge implications for the most vulnerable. 
They also result in significant costs to the financial sector, with insurers paying out over $300 billion for coastal storm damage in the past decade, which is far less than what it's costing governments and taxpayers. By 2050, an estimated 800 million people will be at risk from storm surge from extreme weather, and over 570 low-lying coastal cities will face sea level rise of at least half a meter. The global community will face annual costs of over $1 trillion to coastal urban areas from the combined effects of rising sea levels and extreme weather events on our coastlines. But we can shift this trajectory. There is a significant benefit or dividend to be earned from building resilience in on the front end and anticipating these risks, rather than figuring them out after the fact. Standard investment models don't take account of climate change and other risks, neither do many government plans. If they did, the UN estimates that almost $400 billion could be saved in the next 15 years from investments into disaster risk management. So we need to work on how to change current models to take account of ocean risks and drive investments into mitigating harm and global resilience. The scale and urgency of challenges posed by ocean related risks call for a transformative and global response. And investing in nature and investing in nature based solutions is a key part of that. Most investments to build resilience actually goes into great infrastructure like seawalls or dikes. Nature has either been ignored as an externality or underpriced as a finance and insurance user. But if we could start to change our mindsets and instead consider that nature has been developing and refining engineering solutions to hold back storm surge, reduce seawater inundation, and filter toxins and pollutants for millennia, for millennia, millennia, while humans have been developing and built solutions for a small fraction of that time, then it might become clearer how investing in these five artistic systems. Mangroves, coral reefs, salt marshes, and sand dunes make a lot of common sense, as well as a lot of business sense. Nature based solutions offer a triple bottom line. They are cost effective, they have significant environmental, social, and economic benefits, and they reduce exposure to risks, including emerging climate high emission risks. That said, there are many steep barriers to investing in natural capital and coastal protection. And our alliance has identified five barriers to climate sector investment into the interior. First, there is a lack of understanding of how investment in natural capital can provide timely and open returns. And this is true for both the private and public sector. Second, we don't have applied and tested products that are risk adjusted that can attract financing into this new major space. We can literally cut the number of products on our hands and most of us know the public space change. Third, the data is not only for investors to spend and identify the language of this large, large thing. There's quite a bit of data, but it hasn't has it together in a meaningful way. Fourth, the enabling the policy environment might drive the highest investment into this new natural infrastructure rather than into a more sustainable way in which has been created, which makes it difficult to move these products forward. And finally, there are concerns about whether these investments can deliver returns and ensure the period. Despite these various barriers, there is a huge opportunity to develop a pioneering finance and insurance products that reduce those risks. And that is where my mind comes in. Aura is a multi-city collaboration between government and financial institutions, the insurance industry, the environmental nations, and the state of the world in the south. The alliance has a diverse growing growth network as well as the new and new and new this, this is a new and new for multi multi Leveraging public private cooperation, cooperation to enable any key aspects to the problem solving on critical issues. At the end of the line, I have a hard time to have a personal 
helping out. Uh, if you can let me know, Joanna, if the sound is okay. Great. Thank you. So in the short term, Aura's objective is to identify and nurture six to ten innovative finance solutions to build resilience through investments into coastal natural capital. And the Alliance's work is built around three pillars. The first is practice and innovation actually developing the innovative finance products. The second, around science and research, because these are the foundation stones on which to build these products. And finally, the third is on policy and governance, because if we don't create the enabling environment with a level playing field for these products to operate within, investment will be a challenge. And 2021 is going to be a key year to bring the ocean and climate policy nexus together and drive change. Let's take a closer look at two of our pillars of work. Earlier, I flagged the need to build a pipeline of bankable products. So one of the first things we're doing with the support of the Government of Canada and our partners at the GRP is running an Ocean Resilience Innovation Challenge. The idea behind the challenge is to service new products, help mentor those working on them with additional skills and expertise, and then help them secure investment so that they can pilot and hopefully scale those ideas. We launched the challenge last month to service up to 10 innovative and scalable finance and insurance products that increase coastal resilience and reduce ocean risk while delivering a return on investment. It's especially important that the solutions reduce ocean risk for the most vulnerable with a focus on gender equity and human rights and protecting biodiversity. There's one week left to enter the challenge, so please do look at the information on our website and follow us on Twitter to find out more and submit your application. The deadline is November 20th, and again, that website is oceanriskalliance.org. The initiatives we'll select through the challenge come in addition to a number of projects that Aura is already supporting and scaling around the world with financial support from the Government of Canada. Coastal ecosystems like coral reefs and mangroves play a significant role in reducing risk. Mangroves reduce annual flooding to more than 15 million people, and without them, 39% more people would be flooded each year. Coral reefs work 
as natural seawalls. They're submerged seawalls and they reduce coastal flooding and erosion by dissipating as much as 97% of wave, wave energy. But a lack of understanding around the full value of these assets has led to significant degradation and loss, making these habitats some of the most threatened ecosystems on Earth, which is why we need to invest into them and quickly. So here are a couple of the projects we're working on. Uh, Aura is investing into a blue carbon and resilience credit project led by the Nature Conservancy with support from AXA XL. It's a four-year project to produce blue carbon and separate resilience credits. The goal, to keep CO2 in the ground, provide natural resilience infrastructure by keeping those mangroves in place, conserve biodiversity, and secure a payout to the countries and communities keeping this blue nature intact. Working with the Mesoamerican Reef Fund, another project uh, which also incorporates the Nature Conservancy, UNDP, the Inter-American Development Bank, and Willis Towers Watson, Aura is focusing on how to develop and deliver more parametric coral reef insurance so that these natural defenses are protected and cared for before a storm hits and can be cleared up immediately afterwards. Reefs can be severely damaged by hurricanes, losing between 15 and 60% of live coral cover in one event. Sites hit by hurricanes in the Caribbean saw three times the rate of de degradation compared to those sites affected by other known threats to coral, like um, coral bleaching, overfishing, disease or pollution. Cleaning them up is not usually top of mind for decision makers in a post-hurricane environment. So these parametric measures can combine the plans to care for the reefs in advance and ensure that there are paid trained workers to get in the water and repair them after the storms. And in science and research, we're developing uh, the types of products that we are talking about uh, requires the economic valuations, the modeling, as well as the science and research for investors to understand the risk profiles and benefits, and political decision makers to understand the consequences of an action. AXA is leading the development of a coastal risk index for use by both private and public officials to understand the risk of sea level rise and natural habitat degradation on fiscal policies and to develop new risk transfer products, for example, developing mangrove insurance for ecosystem restoration. And working with our science partner, the Stockholm Resilience Center, we're developing a series of synthesis reports to understand the impacts of ocean risk on the most risk communities in small island development, developing states and uh, the least developed countries, as well as on the women and girls. A report by UN Women concludes that women and girls face the risks of ocean degradation with fewer assets and alternatives to change their livelihoods and less resilience to the loss of natural resources. So understanding these risks is absolutely key. We launched the Alliance just over a year ago and our goal is to transform the space in the next three to five years. So that by 2030, we've driven $500 million of investment into innovative and scalable finance products that increase coastal resilience and reduce ocean risk. We intend to surface at least 15 novel finance products and accelerate five initial pilots to scale, in addition to shaping and mainstreaming nature-based solutions policies as a critical component of disaster risk management and climate adaptation. We hope that many of you will join us in supporting this initiative so that we can get to scale at the pace that the current climate emergency and the biodiversity crisis demand. Sorry to interrupt you, but you have again um, sound problems. If you could fix them, please. Sorry, are those better? Is that better? Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, it's better. Sorry, not sure what is going on here. So hopefully what uh, we've been able to show now is uh, the, the project and uh, some of the issues that uh, we are working on to take forward. 
Um, I see that as I've been talking, there have been a lot of questions that have come in. So I'm hoping that the sound issue is, uh, is, is going to leave us behind, but I know that Joanna will help us uh, along the way um, should that uh, not be the case. But uh, we've got some, some room for, for questions. Again, please uh, add in any questions to the Q&A. Um, and uh, I'm going to start going through some of those questions now. So one of the questions we have has to do with our innovation challenge. Um, and it is, what are the criteria for identifying the 10 scalable resilience innovations? So I know that my colleague uh, Nathaniel Matthews is, uh, is listening in. Um, he's also registered on the site, and so if you go to uh, the Ocean Risk and Resilience Action Alliance um, uh, space at the forum, you can uh, uh, start a chat with Nate, and he can provide you with that information. It is also available on our website. Um, and essentially, uh, we've also done a couple of webinars for folks who are interested, and you can uh, get access to those webinars so you can see those issues there as well. But in essence, we are looking for uh, projects that could potentially drive investment um, into uh, coastal resilience, that work closely with lo local communities, that have a gender element in them, and are also uh, aimed at uh, helping rebuild uh, coastal biodiversity. So hopefully that explains it a bit more, but Nate and the team who are running the uh, Innovation Challenge have all of the details, and as I've said, they are on our website as well. A second question uh, that's come up is to, to specify how coral reef insurance works. Now, I know and I'm hoping that some of our friends from the Nature Conservancy are online as well. Um, you have helped develop this piece of, of insurance. Um, but as, uh, as I had to learn, being an expert on insurance or finance, um, parametric insurance really relates to one parameter that is used to set uh, a payout by the insurance sector. And so the way the coral reef insurance measure works is that uh, well in advance of there being a storm, working with the government uh, or national government, uh, insurers and brokers will identify uh, what, for example, the wind speed needs to be on a hurricane for a payout uh, to be paid. And um, for example, if it's a category three hurricane, they'll agree that in advance. And that way, if there is a hurricane that comes along, as soon as it hits, once it is recorded as a category three hurricane, everyone will be, begin to work immediately to, to get those payouts out the door. Um, and this is really critical because having uh, those, that financing get into the local community, into local cities, uh, is really important uh, very quickly. I remember a couple of years ago, um, we were talking with the uh, Deputy Premier of the British Virgin Islands about uh, one of the hurricanes, Maria uh, Irma, that hit uh, in 2017. And he said that the thing that was most difficult was the length of time it took to get the payouts from the insurance sector. So these parametric insurance measures help deliver that change often you know, within two weeks to a month of impact, which is absolutely critical to um, securing the, the well-being of those reefs. Um, another question there is uh, examples of impact of ocean risk for women and girls. And, and that's a great question, and it is really fundamental to some of our work that we focus on incorporating gender-based solutions from the outset. Um, one example is the, the tsunami that, that struck uh, in the 1990s that hit um, Indonesia and then went across the Indian Ocean. And the, um, some of the, the retrospective um, reviews of those showed that uh, more women were impacted by the tsunamis. As many of them were staying at home uh, to look after the children or the elderly. 
um, they will send the last to leave and get to higher ground and then get recovery forward. So you just have the resources to um, help move their businesses forward or secure the livelihoods of their family assets. A lot of women are engaged in uh, supporting uh, the, the fishery sector and small scale fishers. Is, uh, vessels have been destroyed. Um, there wasn't much of the work that the jobs are the livelihoods for those women to engage in. And so this becomes really, really important as an element. The final piece on this is, is also financial literacy. And actually, one of the projects we're looking at is with our partner, Red, uh, in the Philippines. And they were able to be focusing on financial literacy for women to build that on their seats. Um, so that women can begin to, to break the cycle of financial literacy. I'm sorry, again, the sound. I, I don't know what to do to make the sound sound. I'm very, very sorry. I don't know if it's a headset or anything else, is it back again, again? Uh, no, no. How about if I try this, does this work? Yes, now it's better, yes. Okay, I'm going to take off my headset and apologies for any echo, I'm not sure what's going on. Um, but uh, as I was saying, you know, with our, our, our um, partner Rare, um, we are working in the Philippines on literacy, uh, financial literacy for women, which is also uh, a key uh, part of breaking the, um, the, the dependency of women uh, on, on, on uh, the, the financial uh, dependency of women. Sorry, got a bit distracted by the sound issues there. We have just more than a minute left. I, I have to apologize for all the sound issues, but would recommend that everyone uh, goes to both our website at oceanriskalliance.org, as well as um, to the Paris Peace Forum site that we have. We'll upload a video uh, onto that so that hopefully uh, you'll be able to hear uh, what we've just done. Maybe we'll re-record it, we'll work something out. Um, but want to thank everyone for joining. Please uh, come and meet us uh, at our virtual uh, stand. Um, we are very excited about the potential for this multi-stakeholder alliance, this new multilateralism to build forward, build stronger, better, and build resilience to ocean change in the communities most vulnerable to it around the world. So thank you very much for joining us today.